but my name is Marty Mascari. I'm with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging. Um, and we're proud to present today, um, which has been a very popular topic on trust, um, including special needs trust. And, and we have two great speakers, Fred, Fred Heyman with the, um, he was an attorney and a partner with Heyman Ho, and Brian Hart, who's a vice president of Southwestern Inve Investments Group, are gonna talk to us about um, trust. So um, Fred, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get started if you're ready and, and we'll go from there. Well, thank, thank you very much, Marty. Yeah, my, as, as Marty said, my name is Fred Heyman. Uh, I've been practicing law about 22 years now. Uh, prior to being a lawyer, I was a police officer uh, way down on the border in El Paso, Texas. Um, and, and so I saw a little bit of this uh, when dealing, uh, even as a law enforcement officer, when I didn't deal with people with child protective services and, and issues like that. Uh, but I have been focused my practice uh, specifically in the area of estate and family protection for about 12 years now. Um, what we're gonna talk about today is really the importance of a, a complete plan and, and what we call a family and money protection plan. I, I always uh, cringe with the term estate planning because a lot of people uh, will avoid that because they either have the attitude that they're, it's too complicated and they, they're, they're not wanting to dive into that, or they don't think they have an estate. So they say, well, if I don't really have an estate, what do I need an estate plan for? And so I use the term family and money protection plan because it's more than just talking about taking care of your money. Um, so we do these plans for people uh, of all income levels and all assets, everything you can think of, uh, we take care of people at all levels. And so what we're gonna talk about today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start at the beginning, and I, I titled this um, presentation is a will enough, or does a trust make more sense? Because over and over and over over the last 12 years, I get calls all the time, I need a will, I need a will. And so people have, been, uh, have heard or been told they need a will, and, and they do. But what we're gonna talk about today is that's just really not enough. Uh, and, and so we're going to start at the beginning with a little bit of the things that I, I want you to know you need before we talk into trusts, and then we'll move in into that. So Marty, go ahead and let's move forward. So as I said, should everybody have a will? Yes. Yes, everybody should have a will because if you don't, next slide, if you don't have a will, the government has a will for you. And, and I always say, do you want to write what your wishes are or do you want to rely on the government? And, and all, I've never had a person say they wanted to rely on the government, but after everything that we've been through these last couple of months, I definitely think there's nobody out there that trusts the government to make their family decisions for them. So yes, you want a will, but again, a will is only a death document. What I mean by that is a will does not go into effect until after you're gone. So you write it, you stick it in a drawer, and it has no effect. It gives you no protections. It doesn't do anything until after you pass away. And when you pass away, then it is triggered. A lot of people think that it's, it's good the minute I die. No, not, not, not necessarily, because most wills have to go through probate, which we'll talk about more, but that's the legal system of proving up a will. Next slide, Marty. So yes, there are certain advantages to having a will. You get to write your own wishes. You want it, uh, to state what you want, and how you want, and who you want to get your stuff. Uh, you decide uh, who, will be, who will be the person that distributes your stuff. So you name somebody you trust to carry this on, it's called an executor. You can name guardians for minor children within a will, but I do not recommend that at all. Because as I said earlier, a will is triggered upon death, but it's not valid until a judge says it's good. And that can be months. There could be a big gap between the time of the death and the time it gets to court. If there are children involved, that could cause problems because I have been in situations where Child Protective Services got involved and they took custody of the children saying, yes, I understand the will says aunt so-and-so should be the guardian, but we're gonna take custody of the children until the judge says aunt so-and-so is the guardian. 
So I never ever recommend people use their will to name guardians for minor children. You can put a trust in, and this is what we'll start on trust. You can, you can put what's called a testamentary trust inside of your will. And what a testamentary trust is, is it says, when I die, and when this probate is, when this will is probated, I want a trust set up at that time. I don't recommend those. Because to me, if you need a trust, or if you want a trust, you should set it up now and have it work for you while you're alive and have it be in effect uh, when you pass away rather than it being uh, set up by somebody else after you die. So you're putting the burden on somebody else. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a minute. And you can make gifts and donations to churches and uh, charity organizations and those kind of things. Next slide, Mark. This is where I want to just talk about some of the disadvantages of just having a will. Again, I've already said it takes effect after death. And, and in, I think you all might have received these slides ahead of time. If you don't have them, we'll get them to you. So I'm going to go through some of this rather quickly. I don't expect you to, to read all this. I want to kind of highlight things. Um, they require probate. Probate is a public forum, so it opens the courthouse doors to possible family fights and other problems. Uh, it's a public record, so everything that get, gets filed in a probate, anybody can read. And one of the horrible things that has to be filed in a probate is an inventory. An inventory is a list of all the assets. So I always say, if I, the worst thing I could do to my spouse is to die with just a will, for her to have to go through the legal system to probate that will, and her have to publish an inventory of everything that we have. Now, who reads those inventories? Predators and creditors, bad people. And so we, we tell our probate clients, you're going to get a lot of junk mail, plus you're going to get preyed upon because it's a public record for scammers to take advantage of. And so that's, to me, the worst part about the whole thing is the public nature of the, the proceedings. Um, it doesn't trust tax issues. And if you own real estate in several uh, states, you're gonna have multiple probates. So I've had to do probates to where we probate where they pass away here in Texas. They own a property in Illinois, so we gotta do a probate up there. They own a property in Oklahoma, we gotta do a probate there. So that, that can cause multiple pro problems. Uh, it, it's not only long and dragged out, but who wins? Attorneys do, because you've got to hire legal counsel to do all of this. So I, I really don't recommend that. Next slide, please. Brian, uh, anything that I've said that, that you'd like to jump in on? No, I, you know, I, I, I echo everything you've said. Um, you know, from my seat, we see this a, a, in a different light. You know, we, we usually see this become an issue upon a parent or a loved one passing away. And I always joke, you know, as a financial planner, uh, everyone procrastinates to come see someone like me. And I don't blame them. I mean, we're going to tell them, hey, give us all your money and we're going to charge you fees and stuff like that. And no one wants to hear that. But, you know, our, our job is to commu communicate value. Um, but the only area I see people procrastinate more in is their estate planning and getting good documentation in order. Um, and it's just no one likes talking about death or dying or anything like that. Um, but what I do have is a lot of experience working with clients as well as my own personal experience. My mother passed away probably nine, it was around nine years ago. And what you're saying is accurate. I mean, we had to go through the probate. Um, it, it was costly. It was timely. We had to file uh, inventory, which was just a huge hassle. And it's going on during a period of time where you're grieving and it's, you know, there's just a million things going on. And the last thing you want to do is learn how to probate a loved one's estate. You know, most folks don't do this every single day of their life. So when uh, somebody passes away, you just get everything dumped in your lap all at once and, and you have to learn all of these things. So I think, you know, again, just to echo Fred, what you're saying, much better to be proactive on the front end and uh, have all the decisions made. It's probably one of the best gifts you could give your loved ones. So go ahead. Definitely. And, and what a lot of people don't think about when they, do th when they call me and say, I need a will, they don't think about what would happen if they became incapacitated. Because as I said earlier, a will is just a death document. It doesn't do anything for you during life. So in addition to your will, you need other documents that will allow people you trust to take care of you if the 
unfortunate happens. Uh, I, I think if I, I we, we have, I see about 90 people on this call. I bet if I took a poll, at least 75 of you all have gone through a pretty serious illness at one point in your life because we all get sick and we all get uh, things. I've been uh, going through two. Um, I, in 2007, almost died. I had a disease called ulcerative colitis. I had been fighting it for five years while being a trial attorney, working 60 to 80 hour weeks. Uh, the stress of being a trial attorney plus everything else, I got worse and worse and worse. And at the end of 2006, the doctors came to me and said, we either remove your colon or you're gonna have colon cancer. And I was 42 years of age. Uh, other than this in, uh, inconvenient disease, I was healthy. I was athletic. I was involved in sports all my life. I played rugby in college. I've always been kind of crazy in that regard. I, I, I dictated my own life. All of a sudden I'm told I have to have this surgery. And I'll be honest, at that point in my life, I was a very arrogant, matter of fact, trial lawyer. And the arrogance got in the way of saying, eh, it's no big deal. So, okay, I gotta have surgery. How long am I gonna be off work? That was the first question I asked. And they said, minimum of three months. And I, of course, said, eh, it'll be six weeks, I'll be back. Well, if you ever wanna make God laugh, tell him your plans. Because God had a whole different plans for me. Because the doctors messed up my surgery, my intestines ruptured, I was in critical condition for 10 days. I should not have lived. I was so full of sepsis and infection that I shouldn't have survived. I was in the hospital 37 days the first time. I was out of work for over eight months, had to have six surgeries. The last two, I was shipped up to Cleveland to the Cleveland Clinic to be put back together. And guess what? I didn't have any documents. And why didn't I have any documents? Because I didn't think this would ever happen to me. I'm an attorney, I know what I'm doing, so what do I need these things for? And you know, that arrogance gets in the way. But the problems that my wife had, because I didn't have a power of attorney, a medical power of attorney, a medical directive, all these other documents that you need in addition to a will, I, know, I knew that this is what God wanted me to do. And that's why this is what I do for a living. I wanna help people not go through what I went through. So we never know what's going to happen. So if incapacitation happens, whether it be temporary, temporary could be a couple, few weeks, or in my case, it was eight months, or permanent, you need things in place to help people take care of you. Next slide, Marnie. So, so when you look at doing a plan, or when you talk to your clients or your patients or people that you work with, and ask, start asking them, do you guys have things in place? You need to make sure that, that they have more than just taking care of their stuff. And that's what I said about a will. A will really is only good for giving away your stuff when you die. That's really what it's for. You need something that will protect you, your family, and your stuff. And it's funny because when I ask people, you know, do you think you should do estate planning? Uh, well, I don't know if I should. I don't really know if I have a big enough estate. And I said, well, what's the most important thing in your life? Is it your estate? Is it your money? No, it's your family. And so you want your plan to be in place so that it takes care of your family if this unfortunate event takes place. Next slide. So when you do your planning, there are several options that you get to choose from. And, and th I've listed a few of them here. One, this is the plan that everybody really wants to do, but it's the worst plan you can do is spend every month, every penny I have. I get people all the time. I'm just gonna spend all my money. I'm not gonna leave anything. And uh, well, that's great if you can predict exactly how much you have and exactly how long you're gonna live. You're either gonna outlive your money or you're gonna die before your money's spent. So that's just not a good way to do it. Number two on here, die intestate. Intestate is just a fancy legal term for passing away without a will. And as I said earlier, you don't want that to happen. You don't want your family to rely on the government and the government's rules when you pass, because it can be horrifying, especially if you're in things like a blended family. A blended family a situation is completely different than in, than a, a family with 
one marriage and children are just that marriage. I had a lady come into my office years ago. Her husband had passed away. I'm asking her questions. She was very angry. Uh, people mourn in different ways. This was a very unexpected death. And I asked her, did you have any children? Do you all have any children? And she said, no, we didn't have any kids together. They were married 18 years. We don't have any kids together, but he has a daughter from his first marriage and she's a real blank. And I said, oh, apparently you and your stepdaughter don't get along. They didn't even talk to each other. The stepdaughter was 19. Then I get to the question, did he have a will? And she says, no, he wanted me to help him put a will together months ago. And I told him, you want a will, you, you, you go get a will. And I said, well, I'm sorry you did that because by him passing away without a will and him having a child outside of your marriage, that child just inherited his half of all your community property. And she says, so this house that we have, which was valued at about 250,000 and paid in full. So this house, she just inherited $125,000 in equity in my house. And I said, no, ma'am, she inherited ownership in 50% of that house. You are now partners with your stepdaughter who you don't even talk to. How horrible would that be? And do you think the husband would have wanted that to happen? Of course not. He, he probably, would, that would have been the last thing from his mind. So really bad things can happen if you don't at least do a will. Number three, you can put everything in joint tenancy. Joint tenancy, I, I use this kind of as a, a, a tease because Texas is not a joint tenancy state. Texas is a tenants in common state. Joint tenancy means if I own a house with my wife, I own 100% and she owns 100%, and if I die, it's hers, and she dies, it's mine. In Texas, by being a tenants in common state, we each own 50%. And so when I die, my 50% wouldn't automatically go to her, and if she passes, hers doesn't automatically go to my, me. That's where probate comes in to transfer that interest, and that's where problems come in when you have children outside the marriage. Now, as far as financial stuff, though, Brian, you, you guys can help set up some things in joint tenancy, correct? Yeah, we, we can. Um, ideally, we list it in the name of a trust. And I can't tell you how many people we talk to, you know, we, we talk about estate planning with every client. And, and we talk about the things that we're talking about today. These are good documents to have in order. This is the way that we recommend you get this set up. Um, but when it gets to titling things, and this is, this is a big one, and we've seen this just a blanket statement across the board. Fred, your team does a fantastic job. Once you create a trust, it, it, what's called funding it and making sure that uh, someone who receives a trust, now you have to go put your assets in the name of a trust. Um, if you don't, it's worthless. And we've seen so many people talk to attorneys and they'll come in and they'll show us their six inch binder that's just full of, you know, a thousand different pages that nobody reads because it's, it's written by attorneys. Uh, we can't understand it anyway. Um, and they say, yeah, I have a trust, it's right here. And I said, okay, well, and then I look at all their statements, their bank statements, their investment statements, their beneficiary designations, all these different things on all their different various types of accounts. And the trust is worthless because nothing is titled the right way. Right. It's not any good if you don't put the house in the trust, if you don't put your uh, checking savings accounts in the trust, your investment accounts, um, you know, there's just, and, and that's a big piece to this is just, if you have one, Fantastic. That's step one, but that's not, not the end. You need to make sure all of your assets are listed in it. So, you know, when you're talking joint tenants, joint tenants in common, some people still do some of that, uh, but the beneficiary the designations, having a trust, all these things, just having it titled appropriately is very, very crucial. And, and, and what I was also getting at with, with Brian, you know, you can put some things in joint tenancy, but you can't put everything. So, so even if you go that route, which we don't recommend at all, you can't do that with all your assets. So number four is create a will. We've talked about that. Number five is create what I call a bare bones estate plan. A bare bones estate plan is unfortunately what a lot of uh, non-estate planning attorneys would even do. Uh, they're a fill in the blank, one size fits all type of plan. Do not do that. Um, there are also places like AARP that they, we call them trust mills. Non-attorneys even provide these trusts. 
uh, Susie Orman, I think is one I've heard. These are bare bones trusts that are not tailored to you or your family, and they really cause more complications than they do good. Or you can do a complete family and money protection plan, which is what we're gonna talk about more today. Next slide, Marty. So when doing your plan, as I said, there are certain things to keep in mind. Next. When doing your plan, you've got to face the reality. That there's, there's, there's a term called the, the Stockdale Principle. And it was a, it's, it comes from a guy who was a prisoner of war. And during the, during the war, he and his men survived the prison camp more than any other group because he said, he kept telling his guys, this is horrible. We got to face the reality of what's going on, but we are going to get out of here. And what would happen with the, some of those prisoners in the other groups is they would say, I'm going to be out by Christmas. I'm going to be out by Thanksgiving. And then Christmas would come and then still go. So part of the Stockdale principle is you got to face reality of what's out there when you look at doing your plan. And number one, we are a lawsuit happy society. I bet a, a, a great deal of you all that are watching have been in some type of a lawsuit. You've either been a participant or you were called in as a witness or you had to do a deposition or somehow you were involved because there are over 15 million civil lawsuits filed every year and over 1 million bankruptcy petitions. So the, the reality that lawsuit can happen and bankruptcy can happen you need to have that in mind when you're putting your plan together. Next. This is a horrible one, this next one. And we all heard these stats. Over 50% of first marriages end up in divorce. So there's a 50-50 shot that when my daughters, I have two beautiful daughters, I'm blessed. Uh, it's a probably good chance to say one out of two of them might get a divorce because the odds are that way. Second marriages are worse than first marriages. I think the second marriage, last time I heard it was like 63%. Third marriage is even worse. Over 70% of third marriages end in divorce. So we have to face the reality that divorce is a possibility. How do we plan for that? Next, Marty. This one hits close to home with, I'm sure, a lot of you participants because you're working in this world. But nursing home and long-term care are out of control. The expenses are going higher and higher every year, and people are going broke taking care of their loved ones or their, everything they work for their whole life is going to uh, communities and facilities to take care of them in, as they age. Next. Before we get to this one, Brian, um, on that long-term care one, there are ways to start preparing for that in stuff that you do. Yeah, I was, I was gonna chime in on that one. And, and that one hits, hits home for me too. Um, my grandmother, uh, I didn't have the best parents growing up uh, and God knew that. So he gave me the, the, the most fantastic grandparents known to man. My grandmother and grandfather, they've been always very special, near and dear to my heart. Uh, they were married 60 years before my grandfather passed away. My grandmother, we brought her in. She had early, early dementia signs. And she lived with my family and I for the last four years. And uh, about nine months ago or so, uh, Alzheimer's had kicked in and she just needed more care than we were able to give her. So she, we transitioned her into a, uh, an assisted living community. It's a fantastic place. Uh, unfortunately, COVID hit everything and that's just kind of a, a crazy deal right now. But with, with everything that's gone on, um, I've learned a lot about assisted living, nursing homes, uh, dementia facilities, and they're not cheap. They're not cheap at all. So there's options, you know, out there in different ways to do it. But but one thing that you hear is long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance can be a really good solution for the right person. It's not for everybody, but in certain situations, it makes a lot of sense. For the longest time, they were all pretty much the same. Uh, it's just it's typical insurance. You pay a premium. And if this event happens, if you happen to have to need long-term care insurance, uh, you know, the benefit kicks in. You pay for it. Most people would pay a monthly or an annual premium. And then generally, 
it almost always seemed like it was a husband. He was a grumpy old guy, and he would just say, well, I don't want to get a long-term care insurance policy because if I don't need it and I die, I just wasted all that money. And I'd say, absolutely, that's how insurance works. Uh, if, if I don't get in a car wreck, I'm wasting money on my car insurance. If my house doesn't burn down, I've wasted money on my homeowners. You're not buying it necessarily for that. What you're buying when you get insurance is peace of mind that you will be protected if and when an event happens. So um, long-term care insurance, for the longest time, that's how it worked. You buy a policy, you pay a premium. Um, and then if you passed away, it was maybe not a good investment. And there's different types of policies out there. And I commend everybody on this call because all you're doing is, is you're, you're digging, trying to educate yourself on these difficult, uh, often confusing topics. Uh, so I think that that's, that's a great place to start. Same with long-term care insurance. There's different options out there. One that's been really popular in the last couple of years, it's called an asset-based type um, of product. And what this is, is it works really well if people have money sitting in a checking or savings account that's just, you know, earning the great rate you're getting at your bank today, which is, you know, 0.01% or whatever it is. It's very, very low. If you have money just sitting there not doing anything, well, you might as well, in a lot of cases, it could be a good option to reposition that into a long-term care insurance policy. And they have some that you can just pay an upfront, a lump sum, um, and then what you get is a multiplier. So I'm just going to make this up, but let's say you put $50,000 into a plan like that and you had a, a four times multiplier on that. The multiplier is based on each insurance company. It's based on gender and it's based on age. Um, so it's different for everybody. But let's say it's a four times multiple where you put 50,000 in and then all at once you have $200,000 worth of coverage. And the cool thing here that helped all the grumpy old guys that didn't like the, uh, the old policies the way it works is if you never use it, the insurance company, they'll give you your $50,000 back. You could have it a month and say, you know what, never mind. I changed my mind. I just want my money back. And they'll give it to you. So the nice thing here is you get coverage. Um, and, you know, it has some built-in protections around if you don't use it, you don't lose it. Um, so there's just, my, my point to all of this is there's, there's different options. Certain options may be right for others. Certain, you know, it, everybody's different. So talk to somebody and, and just educate yourself on what's out there because it's, it's potentially really good coverage to have because this stuff gets very expensive and it's only going up. Most definitely. And I, and I think that's the key is, is finding somebody that you trust that will educate you on what, what's good and what's bad and what's not so that you can make the right decision. Because I think uh, that last uh, product you were talking about, Brian, if my understanding is right, even if, if you don't use it and you pass away, then it goes back to your uh, state. It goes it does, state. correct. So, so those are, there's some options out there. A lot of people think, well, I can't afford uh, long-term care insurance. Well, there, there are other options, so find out what that is. Um, there's also Medicaid planning, which we could spend another two hours talking about, so I'm not going to dive into Medicaid planning, but Medicaid planning, there's pre-planning, and then there's crisis planning. And if anybody out there would like more information on that, let me know after this over. I'll be more than happy to get you some information. Back, back to the slides, this is a disturbing slide to me, but it's true. Um, I always say that, you know, I am not short for clients uh, because approximately 70% of the population doesn't have what they should have. They either don't have anything at all, or they have a plan that's outdated, or they have a plan from another state that's not really good here in Texas, or they just don't have what they need, all the documents that they need. So there's plenty of people out there and that's why we do this and this is really I do a lot of these webinars because I want to educate people so that we can reduce that percentage. I make a lot less money helping people put documents together than we do cleaning up the mess when they don't do documents together. So this is a, 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 a statistic that really needs to change. Next slide Marty. Hey Fred real quick um, and I think there was a question in the chat about this too but we get the question a lot. We have a ton of people moving to Texas, a ton of people from California, but really people from all over the place. And maybe they've done some estate planning. They have a will and or a trust from the previous state. What do you tell people that, that have that? You know, can they keep that? Do we need to change it? What's that look like? It's very important that you talk to an estate planning attorney in the state of your residence. So we do. We have a lot of people moving from California out here. California trusts don't work in Texas. And the reason is, is because California doesn't have the homestead protections we have out here. And California doesn't have the, the, the uh, community property protections we have out here. 
So almost there's some states that when people come in, I'll review their plan and, and there's not a whole lot of difference. And then there's some states like California where there's a big difference. And so we don't get rid of their trust. We just restate it. We rewrite it and make it a Texas trust. So we update it. We make it a, a document for where they live. So the same thing when if you're moving. I've had people come to me and say, hey, I want you to do my documents. I'm moving to Colorado in six months. And I tell them, no, you don't want me to, you don't want to pay me to do your documents because in six months you need to talk to a Cal Colorado attorney and get things done up there. So they, they do need to be state specific. One of the other uh, questions I saw in the chat was, can you put a house in a trust if there's a mortgage on the house? I'm going to address that one real quick. Yes. Yes, you can. Um, one of the other questions was the cost of trusts, and I'm going to hold off on that uh, answer uh, a little longer because I think I'm going to answer some of that as we go through, but if not, I'll, I'll get to that one at the end. Now, I, in, the, in the 12 plus years that I've been doing this, I found that my, when my clients come to me, and I think you guys, are, as we see these slides, you're going to say, yeah, that's me. I get these six major concerns that, that clients want to address. Next slide, Ernie. The first one is, how can I put a plan together that keeps the government and the courts out of my life? So is there a way for me to put a plan for my family together to keep the government and courts out of my life? The answer is yes. And that's really what a trust is all about or trust mechanisms. When you look at the, the history of trusts, trust came about during the Roman Empire way back when Jesus and before Jesus was, was on earth. And, and they were built to, so that the rich Romans could pass their wealth down to their, their kids out of government intervention and without court intervention also, without having to deal with the courts. The same thing is today. Trusts are made so that we can do things in the privacy of our own family and we can transfer things outside of government intervention, outside of the courts. Number two, Marty? This is the one I get all the time. How do I avoid paying unnecessary taxes? And I wish I could say I could help people avoid all taxes, but that's not a reality. We all have to pay our share of taxes. But this question always reminds me of one of my favorite stories in the Bible, where they ask Jesus, should we pay our taxes? And Jesus says, whose face is on the coin? And they said, Caesar. And he says, you give Caesar what is Caesar's, you give God what is God's. Our job is to make sure we don't give Caesar any more than we have to, and Caesar makes the rules. So you use Caesar's rules for your advantage. Whether you like Trump or not, he is probably one of the kings of using Caesar's rules to keep from paying taxes. Because if he was doing things wrong, he'd be in jail, he, he's able to use his wealth and use things he does to avoid paying taxes. And we may not like it, but Caesar makes the rules. And so we use these trust mechanisms to help our clients not pay taxes any more than they have to. Uh, we're doing a couple of, uh, of large estates right now that what we're doing for them literally is saving the family millions of dollars in taxes because of what the, the planning does. Same thing with some financial mechanisms like Brian works with. Uh, Brian is really big on tax. So I'll let you talk about this real quick, Brian. I think that's the one of the biggest underserved areas from financial planners. Everybody again says, hey, give me your money and we'll, you know, they talk stocks and bonds and mutual funds and you know, whatever they're looking to invest it in. And that's a piece of it. But I think if you're doing that piece well, which these days most people should be, I think the, the biggest opportunity as a financial planner is around tax planning. Because if we can save, Fred, like you said, you, you know, you're working with clients, potentially saving them millions and millions of dollars. And this kind of goes back to, you know, having, having everything titled, titled appropriately as well. We had a client, um, very, very, very wealthy client, and it's multi, multi millions of dollars. And they had a beneficiary that was set up uh, to go to their estate. And then they wanted that money to be sent to a charity. And that's just, they're above the estate tax rules. They're, they're going to be taxed 40% on all of that. It's, it's outrageous. And just through proper designations, it goes directly to the charity. There's no, it was millions of dollars of taxes 
that were not going to the federal government that now are going to the charity. And you think that doesn't make somebody happy? Our, one of our goals for every single client of ours is to make sure that we're helping reduce their lifetime tax burden. And these are, you know, the rules around this change all the time. Under the Biden administration, we will most certainly see some sort of changes either this year or next year, I would assume, probably next year. But uh, it's something we're watching closely. So then what's, what's your plan for that? Most people would say, oh, I just, you know, I'll, I'll let my CPA handle that. But what we've found is CPAs don't know much about tax planning. And that sounds really funny, but, uh, you know, most CPAs, what they do is they want to fill out your 1040 and, and file a tax return for you. So they say, hey, bring me your shoebox full of your receipts and your 1099s. We'll be the data entry clerk and we'll pop out a 1040, you sign it, and you'll either owe or you'll get money back. That's what I do as a CPA. It's been very difficult for us to find really good qualified tax planning partners that will sit down and review, well, how are you giving? Are you giving to charity? Are you itemizing? Are you taking a standard deduction? How much are you paying in property taxes? What, you know, what does all this look like? Um, are you phasing out of certain things? You know, are you using the Affordable Care Act? Because those premiums go up based on your income. So are there ways to reduce income? Are you maxing out whatever tax bracket you're in and taking advantage of all the many benefits of, of you know, every tax law that's written? Like Fred said, it's, it, again, it's just all about educating yourself and understanding how does this work and how do I use it to my advantage? So the tax piece, it's something I'm very passionate about. It's something I feel like uh, most folks don't do as well as they could. And there's just a ton of value there. So I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, but thank you, Fred. Well, and that's why it's very important that not only you look at, at putting a good legal plan together for this purpose, you also tie that in with your CPA and your financial advisor and everybody's on the same page. So, so they, you, you should have a group, a, a group approach. I, I talk, you know, Brian and I have a lot of clients in, in, uh, that use both me and him. And we talk all the time about, okay, uh, how is, what are you doing? What am I doing to make sure we're all on the same page? Uh, let's go to number three, Marty. Number three, again, how do I avoid going broke with nursing home? This is one, again, I can make another two hour presentation. Uh, there are planning ways to do that. So we're gonna not, I'm not gonna talk, but there are trusts to do that also. There are Medicaid qualified trusts that we set up to help people get qualified for Medicaid to take help, help, help with this. Uh, and there are other types of trusts we can set up to avoid going broke because of these two things. Number four, Mike. This is one of my favorite. How do I protect my family's wealth from predators and creditors? How do I put what, what some people know as the term asset protection? How do I protect my assets so that it's not taken from my family? Trusts are the only way you really can do this because a trust... Trust will allow you to protect assets so if a person gets sued, I, I have it set up to when my daughters inherit, they've got a trust in place that says, if they get divorced, it's not going to my ex-son-in-law. If they get sued, they can't take it. If they get uh, going to bankruptcy, unfortunately, it can't be taken. If their creditors come after them, it can't be taken. So there are ways to build protections in that to protect it against those people. Uh, number five, this is another one of my favorites. How do I avoid family fights over money? If you ever want to find out how dysfunctional a family is, have somebody in the family die with money because money is the root of all evil and it brings out the worst in people and it brings out greed. After I quit being a trial attorney, when I got sick and I transitioned over to estate planning and elder law, Apparently, I was a good trial attorney because for the first six years, all I handled was family fights in probate court. So I didn't want to do litigation anymore, but I, I did litigation in family court in, in probate court. Families fighting over estates and families fighting over control of money when mom has Alzheimer's and needs a guardian. Now, I told my clients this, and, and I'm going to tell you all this. Whenever a family fights, only one person wins, and that's me, the attorney, because the legal fees are outrageous when they fight like this. I had an estate in El Paso. I was working back in El Paso before I moved my law firm out here in 13, and I had a case out there where it was the, the estate was only worth about $300,000. 
I was representing what I call good brother and good sister against bad brother. Bad brother had done some things to try to grab all 300,000 so that his siblings didn't get any. And the fight ended up, we settled it at the end of it. Uh, it, it went three ways, just like it should have. It took three plus years to do it. And legal fees were over 100,000. So 100,000 went to attorneys. 200,000 got split between the three when it was all said and done. Who won? Yeah. So that you, you want your plan to be iron tight so that it avoids this. I've had people come into my office and say, well, I got a trust. I had this trust done and, and here it's, it's 20 pages long. And I tell them, that's not going to protect you because a trust has to be comprehensive. It has to be well done on my side of the fence so that there's not problems on your side of the fence, the family side of the fence. And, and it's kind of like I always said, I, I love putting things together. I, I, I love working with my hands. But most of you all have had something that you bought, a piece of furniture or something like that, that you get instructions for. And sometimes the instructions come in and they're really good and you can walk through and put something together. And sometimes the instructions, there's no instructions at all. I've, I've had some like that and I have to look and try to figure it out myself. Or sometimes there's instructions that no doubt they were apparently originally written in Chinese and then they were translated to English and not translated well. And you're fumbling your way through them. That's like having a not good trust, a bare bones trust or not having documents at all. So you want your instructions to be so ironclad that we avoid these kind of things. Number six. This one is absolutely my, my favorite and the one I, I am most passionate personally about is how do I pass on more than my stuff? If I'm gonna do a plan, and that's again why I don't like the term estate plan, because we wanna pass on more than just your estate. We wanna pass on you. And this means a lot to me because I, I had a father who was in Vietnam and he was in an organization within the Air Force where he basically was a military spy. And everything that he did was top secret. And when he retired, he couldn't tell us about it. And so many years growing up, I would ask my dad about things and he'd say, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. So my dad passed away in 1995 from pancreatic liver cancer. And he took with him a lot of his life. I wish he would have taken the time to write down or record some of the things he did in life. I, I was telling you, I don't want military secrets, but I do want to know where, where did he go? What did he do? What did he see? What did he experience? My, my dad would make comments that I'd get little bitty snippets once in a while. I remember we, we turned on the movie Apocalypse Now one time and they were talking about going into Cambodia. And I said, dad, did you ever go into Cambodia? And he paused for a minute and said, not officially. You know, so little things like that, I, I would love to have known so much more. And I, I have two girls who ask about Grumpy all the time. And there's only so much I can tell them because there's so much about his life I don't know. So this one is really important to me with helping my clients pass down more than just their stuff. Brian, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think you summed that up perfectly. Okay, let's go to the next slide. In order to try to make this a little bit easier, I want to use a family situation. So, so instead of just giving you a bunch of legal stuff, I want to give you a real life situation. So we're going to use the, the Smith family here to kind of explain the benefits of, of trust. We got Bob and Sue. They're in their mid-60s. They're worth about 750000 I did that on purpose because I don't want them to be wealthy. Everybody thinks, oh, trust, that's for the multimillionaires. No, it's not. So they got an estate worth about 750000 uh, In In Dallas-Fort Worth, as we were talking about at the beginning, that's almost a house now. So, so most people have, you know, if they've been working in their 60s, they probably have a million and a half estate easy because half of it may be their house or, or a third of it may be their house. Um, they have two children, Jeff and Jennifer, and, and uh, I, I did this this way because um, we can always tell there's one good child and there's one not so good child. Um, and I don't know about your family, but I've not met too many families where there wasn't this situation. There's always 
uh, what they call the black sheep or there's, there's problems. I, I, it's funny, I get people that come in my office and apologize about their dysfunctional family. And I tell them, well, when I find a functional family, I'll let you know, because I, I can't find one yet. They're, we all have our issues at, at some level. Next slide. So what if Bob has a stroke and the, and the Smith family, all they've done is a will? Next slide. Will Sue, Jeff, or Jennifer be able to make information and find out information about Bob in a medical emergency? As I've said at the bottom of this slide, the worst thing you can ever hear from a medical professional is I'm sorry, but I can't talk to you. And you all know the importance of HIPAA and how that comes into play. And if you don't have documents that say who can gather medical information or who I can talk to, that causes major, major problems. Now, people think, well, but you know, you sign those documents when you go to the doctor, you sign those documents when you go to the hospital. Well, what if Bob has a stroke? Will he be able to sign any documents at that point? No. When I got sick, when my intestines ruptured, I was rushed to the hospital. And the last thing I remember the doctor asking my wife is, does he have a medical directive? Does he have a medical power of attorney? Does he have a will? I had none of it. I had none of that in place at all. And at one point in that first 37 days, my wife comes in and says, I'm trying to apply for your, your disability policy so that we can get some money in to pay our bills. And they won't give me your medical records because you didn't sign a HIPAA form when you came in. Well, no kidding, because I came in an emergency. So you have to have documents ahead of time so when this happens, you don't hear those horrible things, I can't talk to you. Next slide. Will they be able to make decisions for them? You know, the reality is if you do not have a medical power of attorney saying who can make medical decisions for you if you're not well, the doctors and medical professionals have full 100% legal authority to make all decisions. They do not have to consult with the family. Now, hopefully sometimes they do, and, and quite often they do outside of not having these documents, but they don't have to. And, and I've had that situation come up where parents of a child who's now 19, 20, the child's in the hospital and the parents think, well, I'm their parent. And the medical professionals say, I'm sorry, they're an adult now. They didn't sign any documents. I, I can't talk to you or you, you're really not the one that can make medical decisions for them at this point. That's horrible, horrible place to be. Next slide. One thing we've seen too sometimes is uh, what if the doctor, you know, like you said, hopefully they are talking to the family, but what if mom, dad are in an auto accident, for example, and they're both on life support. And then you have the, you know, the brother and the sister there and they say, okay, really sorry about what happened. Uh, here's our options. Leave them plugged in or unplug them. What do you want to do? And, you know, brother, sister, you know, like the ones that you have on your slides, it's again, it's an emotional situation. It's a tragic time. It's hard to make these decisions. Uh, but what if, what if sister says leave them plugged in and brother says unplug them? What do you do now? And, and you know, you're going to do one or the other. And now they're pinned against each other. One feels like they won. One feels like they lost. They're probably going to have issues, you know, with each other for the rest of their life. One of the biggest gifts, and we said this early on, that you can give your family is take that decision away from them. Have your wishes written down. So now it's just, it's just a, hey, here, here, here are my wishes. Here's what mom wanted. Here's what dad wanted. Here's what we need to do. Um, it, one of the best things you can do is to, to take that decision away from others and have your wishes written down. And I just had a question come in. And wouldn't the spouse have le legal in okay and be able to make decisions? That is not automatic. So no, spouses do not automatically have the ability to make decisions for each other. My wife didn't automatically have a, a, the, the decision, the, the authority, the legal authority to make decisions for me. If the doctor didn't want to consult with her, they didn't have to. And so that's where family fights come in. That's where family discord comes in. You just want to avoid that by having stuff in place. So that's the healthcare part. What about the financial part? When somebody becomes sick, is there going to be somebody able to pay their bills, manage their accounts, go to the bank and get money, transfer money if it needs to, pay utility bills, go to the employer and get a paycheck or talk to them about you know, benefits. 
if you don't have documents in place, you may be able to, to get away with it at the hospital because they may cooperate, but financial institutions won't. By no means at all will they let you deal with other people's finances if you don't have legal documents in place. And I've seen people completely shut down in the water, not being able to do anything financially until we go to court and get a guardianship for the person and have the court appoint somebody because there's no documents in place. So you definitely don't wanna be in that situation at all. Next slide. What if Bob, be, Bob becomes permanently disabled and needs full-time care? Next. If he doesn't have anything but a will, now we're probably dealing with the thing we call guardianship. Guardianship is a legal process. It's also called living probate because it goes through the probate court. It's a legal process of appointing somebody as legal guardian over the person to take care of them and over the estate to take care of their money. And these processes are horrible. They're long drawn out, they're stressful, and they're very, very expensive. Next slide. They're humiliating, they're time consuming, and as you can see, most guardianships are $10,000 and up to get somebody legally appointed to take care of somebody. It's, it's just not a place you wanna be. Next slide. What happens when Bob passes away? Now, next, we got, now we have to deal with death probate. The process of notifying the beneficiaries, notifying potential creditors, collecting the assets, resolving any disputes that come up uh, between family, paying the creditors, filing the inventory, possibly having to get an appraisal of the assets. I've had to do that multiple times with artwork and antiques and coin collections and gun collections, stuff like that. Um, and, and those appraisers aren't cheap. Uh, changing title to assets and then distributing the estate. It's a long drawn out, even if it's easy, even if everything goes well, you're looking six plus months. Right now in COVID times, we have about 50 cases waiting to go to a hearing because we can't do anything because the courts aren't working well right now with COVID in place. So I've got a bunch of people on hold, can't administer their estate because they're, we're waiting on the courts. Next slide. So you wanna avoid that process because not only the, 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 what I've talked about, but that one's not cheap either. A typical probate today is about $4,500 plus. So I always tell people by doing a trust, you avoid this and we'll talk about it in a minute and I'm gonna to have to speed up because I'm, I, I'm seeing we're running out of time. Um, when we get to court, uh, when you have a, a trust, you, a family trust for husband and wife, you avoid two probates. So I have already said the cost of doing a trust replaces two $4,500 fees minimum. So you're saving at least $9,000 plus just in probate fees by doing a trust. Next slide. When, you know, if Sue gets Alzheimer's after Bob has, you know, become incapacitated, now we got to deal with maybe another guardianship. We got to deal with long-term care we've talked about. Um, the national average, last time I checked, uh, in nursing home stays is at least 2.4 years. I think it's probably going up. Uh, I haven't looked at it in, in, in a couple of years because people are just living longer. And so the longer we live, the more it has to be paid for. So it, if there's no planning for that, it can cause major problems. Next slide. Once again, the, the family can be in probate court to fight over guardianship if mom gets Alzheimer's. And I guarantee that uh, Jennifer may be the best choice in this situation, but Jeff's gonna fight to do that if he can control the, the money that mom has. And, and so I've seen families split apart because of things like this. Next slide. When Sue passes away now, again, I, uh, as I said earlier, we got probate number two we've got to deal with, another expense. Next. The top three things that, that parents, you know, so quite often, you know, we, we, we forget about ourselves and we don't take care of ourselves, but, but we, we worry about when my wife and I pass away, what am I gonna, when it goes to my kids, what if they get divorced? How do I protect it against predators and creditors? And what if they actually have medical issues and they have to go through bankruptcy or they get sued? 
these are the big top three risks that we look at with, the, with most families uh, as they pass that inheritance down to the children. Next. And we talked about Jennifer and, and, and her brother and how wonderful Jen Jennifer looked like she had her stuff together. She looks like she knows what she's doing, but uh, how many uh, good kids in the family have this for the spouse? We have problem son-in-laws, problem daughter-in-laws that we want to protect against. We want to make sure that when we're doing our planning, we keep all of this in mind. And this is why it is so important that everybody does a plan tailored to their family. Because as I, you can see by the story, every family is different. And every family has unique situations and your plan needs to cover and take care of those unique situations. And another thing, they change over time. So once you do a plan, it's not the Ten Commandments. You don't chisel it in stone to forget about it. You need to make sure you keep up with it over the years. Next slide. I like this one. Jeff, Jeff is a kind of walking liability. What if we give him money? Uh, I, I was in a, a presentation one time, and they had a gentleman that, uh, that owned a Lamborghini dealership. And he came in and said, how many of you all, it was a bunch of estate planning attorneys, how many of you all think, uh, you know, that if, if your clients leave their children money, they'll come to see me? And of course, a lot of hands rose up. Yeah, the wealthy clients get money. They're going to go down to the Lamborghini dealership. And he says, what do you think the average time is for them to come see me? And the answer was before the funeral. So he said he couldn't tell you how many children who inherited a lot of money came to see him before the parents were even buried. How horrible. But it can happen. So you, thinking about leaving your kids a large sum of money, and a large sum of money could be a hundred thousand dollars. Doesn't have to be millions. Could be fifty thousand dollars. That you know, a lot. Of, what would a kid do with that? It's kind of like hitting the lottery. Next. Hey, real quick, just to tag onto that. Uh, in this Sue Happy society that we live in, the more money you have, the bigger the target is on your back. So there's people out there. We all know it that they're just looking for an opportunity, and if if you have a bunch of money and I can run you off the tollway and say it was your fault and now I, I can sue you or something like that, that stuff just happens. So um, this isn't something I do or even Fred does, but a really good thing just to increase your, your protection there is just contact your insurance agent and see about an umbrella policy. They're cheap and they offer some pretty good protection relative to the cost. So that's all I'll say on that, but it's, it's good insurance to look at. Most definitely. I, I, People, it's funny because when I'll do plans for people, they'll say, well, does that mean I don't need my insurance? No, yeah, you need insurance. You want multiple protection or what we call defenses against the possibility. So so even my big business clients, I, I want them to have every bit of insurance that they can get and afford. And then we do their plan on top of that to make sure they're even more secure. So again, how can the Smiths fix all this? They fix it by using trust. Next slide. The trust mechanism is the best thing used to protect families and to have things do exactly the way they want. One more click, Marty. I'm gonna focus really on what we call the living trust. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what the trusts are, but the most common trusts that we set up for, for families are some version of a living trust. Next slide. So there really are four different categories of trust. There's a living and testamentary, and I've already kind of told you a little bit about that. A testamentary one is one that's done in a will, and it's set up after the person dies. Again, I don't recommend it because you're not getting any benefit from it today, and you're putting the burden on somebody else to set it up. And then there's revocable trust and irrevocable trust. I'm sure you've heard those terms. But all that means is a revocable trust I have control over. I can modify it, change it, add to it, subtract from it. I have complete control. An irrevocable trust is more like the Ten Commandments. We chisel it in stone and it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to change. So there's some, a lot of times irrevocable trusts are used for special things. We, I don't do a lot of irrevocable trusts, but a lot of our trusts that start revocable at different stages of life, they become irrevocable so, so as they pass down. The living trust is what you set up during lifetime. So it's good while you're alive. It gets you benefits while you're alive. It avoids probate. It avoids guardianship. And it passes things down the way you want them to do. Next slide.
Let's go one more. There we go. When you set up a trust, there, there are three main actors that deal with it when you do a trust. And the easiest way to remember them, a trust is like setting up a living lock box, a, a box that, that you build so that you can hold your stuff. And the trustor is the person that builds the box. The trustee is the person that manages what you put in the box. And the beneficiary is the person that gets the benefit of what's in the box. And so when I set up a living trust for me and my wife, for instance, we're the trustor, we build the box. We're the trustees, we manage what's in it because it's our stuff. And we're the beneficiaries while we're alive. Now, when we pass away, then the trustee may change because we gotta name somebody that succeeds us after we leave. And the beneficiaries will change depending on where I wanna leave my stuff. Next slide. One more time. So again, it's all a matter of how you hold your assets. So it, it doesn't change your life any. People say, oh, I don't wanna set up a, a trust because I lose control of my assets. No, you don't. It, it's a difference in the how you hold it. And, and, and for instance, if, if you don't have a trust right now, whatever assets you have, your house, your bank accounts, whatever you have, you're holding them in your hand. You have control over them. And so if I get sick, what happens? Somebody has to figure out what to do with my hand. And they gotta, you know, if I'm holding it, they may not be able to get a hold of it. If I die, I'm still holding it until a legal process happens to let go of it. A trust is where I take this stuff and I put it in a safe. It's in a safe, I got the combination, I control the whole thing, I can open it and close it when I want, I can do whatever I want with it, and I can decide who has combination to it at now or at a later time. Next slide. And as, as Brian touched on earlier, it's a matter of when you build this box, or what I also call a treasure chest, it's aligning your assets to it. You gotta put your stuff in the box. So once you build the box, you gotta put your stuff in it. We retitled the house. I don't own my house. My house is no, owned in the name of my trust. My bank accounts are not in my name. They're in my trust name. My investment accounts are either in my trust name or my trust is the beneficiary of it. So it's all a matter of way you, what uh, some people have heard of the term funding a trust. It's aligning the assets with the trust. And that, and people say, well, what if I add assets later? Well, you align them with the trust. You don't have to change the trust. You don't have to rewrite the trust. I, I, if, I, if I open a new investment account with, with Brian, we just make sure it's in the name of the trust. So you just need to make, and that's why it takes the professional you need to talk to so that it's properly aligned with the trust. Next slide. And Brian, do you find that, again, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, do you find that often, unfortunately, people have not aligned their stuff that you have even, if you have control, have, have you ever had a situation where somebody had a trust and they didn't tell you about it? Often. Um, we talk about it and, you know, we've had clients that we've had for years and it's, it's stuff we've talked about and they forgot they had a trust and then they, it, you know, Three years later, something triggers. It's like, oh, yeah, we did do that. We're good. We have a trust. And I'm like, well, no, you're not good because I have your assets and none of your assets are in the name of the trust. So then they show us, you know, it, it's, it's a real easy fix. Uh, if, the, if the trust is created, it's real easy to put your assets in the name of the trust. It's not difficult. It's just it's often an overlooked step. Um, attorneys, no offense to you guys, Fred, again, you guys do really well, but you know, they, they bill on writing the trust. So they write it, they give it, you pay for it. Then they, you know, they're good. They're done. They're, you're not done. Um, a good attorney is going to tell you, hey, go put all of your assets in the name of the trust. Or, and you will have listed out your assets. Here's your, put your home, put your checking, put your savings, put your investments. I want your IRAs and your Roth title this way. On your 401k, do this. So they'll, they'll go through all of your assets and tell you exactly how to do it. Right. And, 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 a, and a, a great attorney will not just tell you to do it, but they'll help you. Correct. Um, and, and one of the things that when I first became an estate planning attorney and I started doing this, I, I very quickly decided that I don't like the way estate planning attorneys work. Their, their attitude is I'm gonna draft this beautiful, complicated trust. I'm gonna give it to my clients. I've done my job and I'm done. And, and that's what I call the transactional world. 
That's not what you need. You need somebody that not only will put it together, but help you with it and walk you through it. We have programs within our firm where our clients stay with us nonstop. They, they, they pay a monthly fee to always stay current on their trust. We call them our life planning clients. We have other clients that will we'll help them with funding. So you need to have that relationship. You need to have somebody that does more than just put it together for you, that, that helps you with it uh, through the process. You also want to build a trust because it build, builds in protections. Uh, as I said earlier, one of the biggest concerns is how do I keep the government and the courts out of my life? A trust does that. It privatizes your life. It takes the courts out. It takes the government out. And it allows you to build in protections for you, your spouse, your children, and even your grandchildren. Next slide. So let's go through that again. Now Bob has a stroke and Bob has a living trust. Now what happens? Next slide. Is there a need for guardianship? No, because not only does, does he have documents like medical power of attorney and power of attorney, and those documents that we need, but the trust has language in it that helps us avoid guardianship. I always say that my power of attorney and my medical power of attorney are great as long as I cooperate because those documents are I give it, I can take it away. I give you permission to take care of me, but what if all of a sudden now my mind says, I don't want you to take care of me anymore. Alzheimer's, dementia, brain injuries, other injuries. I had a very bad Alzheimer's case that daughter was taking care of mom for years on her power of attorneys. And all of a sudden mom's Alzheimer's got to paranoia. Daughter was stealing all her money. Daughter was out to get her. Daughter wanted her dead. None of that was true, of course, but that's not what mom's mind said. So I always say that my trust needs to be set up where it allows my family to take care of me even if I don't cooperate. So there's safety mechanisms so that they can't take advantage of that. They've got to prove I'm incapacitated. They got to medically prove I'm not thinking straight, all that. Once that's done, that allows them to continue to take care of me and continue to take care of the estate. Next slide. When Bob passes away, do we have to do a probate? Next. No, we do not. So we've avoided probate. And as I said, a, a marital trust avoids two probates for both spouses as they pass away. When I die, my, my wife doesn't have to hire an attorney, go to court, deal with all that. When my wife dies, my kids don't have to hire an attorney, go to court and deal with all that. Next slide. In addition to that, I can build in mechanisms within a trust. And again, a trust is a lot like, or, or if you do the plan right, and you, sometimes we use multiple trust mechanisms, but it's like building a house. Do we want to add rooms? Do we want to subtract rooms? What rooms do you, does your family need, et cetera? My, my, mine has uh, built into mine a, a mechanism, a room, that allows us to avoid capital gains tax. It allows me to do remarriage protection. I always say that one of the things I want to make sure of is that if I die first, my half of the estate is secure for my children, not my replacement, the Anna Nicole Smith protection. You can build that in. We can build in asset protection. By doing that remarriage protection, my half of the estate being secure for my children, that allows my wife to continue living on the entire estate, but half of the state now has asset protection. So my half of the estate, if she's sued, they can't get it. So you build in these mechanisms within this, this plan that you're doing it's so awesome the things that you can, we can do with them. Next, next slide. So again, if, if, if Sue gets Alzheimer's, we don't have to worry about a second guardianship because the trust already says, maybe she wants Jennifer to take care of her if that happens. And Jennifer will have authority to take over without having to go to court. Next slide. And when Sue passes away, again, no second probate. Next. Also, we can, we, uh, trust will fix the three risks. I have a trust in place that I, it's called heritage protections for my children. My, the money goes from our trust once we pass away to their new trust called the heritage trust. The heritage trust says that is not your money. 
it's my money for your benefit. So if my daughter gets divorced, can her ex fight after my money? No, they can only fight over their money. And since it's in my heritage trust and it's not her money, it's not seen as her money, it can't be lost in a divorce. It can't be lost by creditors and predators that are factor. It can't be taken in bankruptcy or lawsuits, et cetera. So I build in those added asset protections for my children. And also within that, I can build in other protections uh, against themselves, as we'll see in a minute. Next slide. So I'm going to go through these kind of really quickly so that we have time for questions. So I know we're running out of time. But so I can set it up to where we have different uh, heritage trusts for each child. So let's say Jennifer's uh, responsible. I know she's smart with money. I can give her a heritage trust with access. Jeff, not so smart. He's not going to spend his money widely. We can put limitations on him. Next slide. But at the same time, Jennifer has access to it. It protects it against her deadbeat husband who may want to try to take it at some point. Next slide. As far as the limitations on Jeff, we can have an outsider uh, manage the money so that it can be taken and all those things. And it also protects Jeff against himself if he has certain problems. Next slide. Let's say we have a, a, a child with an alcohol problem or a drug problem or a gambling problem. We can build in incentives saying, okay, if you get your act together and you clean it up, then you'll have more access to your money. But if you don't, you don't. Um, I had that for mine. My, my trust said, my daughters only get money if they go to college. And, I, and so, so it's an incentive for them to go to college. Luckily, both of my daughters, I don't think I have to worry about. One's at the University of Alabama right now. And the other one's talking about wanting to go to the Air Force Academy. So I think, I think that incentive is not needed, but it's there. And we can always build those things in. <clears throat> I had a lady once say, I want to I trust that says my kids only get money if they have a job. I don't want them to sit on their butt and think they're going to live off of mommy's money. They got to earn some money and then I'll match it with that. So we can be all kinds of creative with these trusts. Next slide. And then this one, the special needs trust. Any family that has a special needs child has to have a trust because the worst thing that could ever happen is for a child with special needs or an adult with special needs to inherit something. If they inherit something outright, they can lose all of their benefits. <clears throat> so a special needs trust either needs to be set up ahead of time so that it has money put in it for the child or it's formed after passing and the money folds into a special needs trust so that the child doesn't lose benefits. Uh, and, and I know I, I can talk to you all, almost every family is touched by somebody with special needs. I have an autistic nephew. And unfortunately, I have a, a sister, her, her, her mom. Uh, she doesn't have a whole lot, but for years I've been telling her she needs to set this special needs trust up and she won't do it. And, and I know that when, when she passes and Josh inherits, I'm gonna have to scramble so that I can make sure that he doesn't lose his benefits or he doesn't lose them for very long because he may lose them for a few months until we get things in order. But, but anybody you know that has a special needs issue has to have this trust. Now, again, my trusts also are built so they, they can trigger special needs if they're needed. I always tell people, I have two beautifully healthy children. I'm blessed. But one car accident away, and they may not be. So I don't want that to happen and my child to inherit and not be able to get benefits later. So we have triggering mechanisms that can convert the trust into a special needs trust if they need it at the time they inherit. So this is extremely important. There are two types of special needs trusts. They're called first party and third party. And that's all where does the money come from? Does, a, does the money come from a third person? So like, do I put money in my child's? It came from me. It's not our, their money. And, and where that comes in is can Medicaid uh, try to get it back when that child passes away? If it's my money in their trust, they can't. But what if it's their money? So I've had children become special needs because of a horrible accident and a lawsuit gave them a million dollars in their special needs trust. At the end of their life, Medicaid could ask for reimbursement out of that first party 
of trust. So if you want to know more about special needs trust, please let me know. We'll, we'll be more than happy to talk later. Uh, next slide. And this is just some ideas of some things you can do with irrevocable trust. We do them for Medicaid planning. We do them for asset protection. There's life insurance trust that you can put in. There's charitable remainder trust. Uh, there's all different types of irrevocable trust. But as you can see, almost all irrevocable trusts are set up for special circumstances and they're used for special things. So I think we're about at the end, aren't we, Marty? So this was just kind of a slide. How do you want to be remembered? When you think about doing your planning, do you want to just ignore it and keep procrastinating, not do anything and leave problems? Or do you want to do things and do them right so that they, as Brian said earlier, the best thing you could ever do for your family? Uh, next slide. When you do your plan, you want to make sure that you keep the most important thing in mind, and that's what's important to you. And so I always tell people, the great thing about doing planning uh, with somebody that knows what they're doing is I know the law. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to legally protect you, but I don't know you. So I need to merge what's important to you with what's important to the law so that we have a great, secure plan. Next slide. But it takes action, so please don't leave this presentation today and say, oh, I'll get to it, um, because you got to put it into action. Uh, next slide. I love this picture. Please don't leave this presentation and do this. Um, I, I love that quote from Picasso, only put off until tomorrow what you're willing to left, ha, you're willing to die having left undone. This is not one of those things. So, so let's put it in place. And I think the last one is questions. There we go. I think we've got a few more minutes. So uh, Marty, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Do you wanna address any of the questions that have come in? Uh, do you guys wanna take them? You guys can just take them. Um, as they come, there's several of them. Um, some of them are, are, I get into personal issues. I'm not sure about legal advice and that kind of thing, but, um, but some of them are general questions. Okay. Um, Fred, I can, I can read them to you if you'd that, like. That would be wonderful, Sheila. Okay. What if a will states that inheritances are non-negotiable? Such as, if you disagree with the will of the deceased, you lose your part of the inheritance assigned in the will. Does this help with probate or speed up the process? Um, well, it, it helps if the family is trying to fight. It's that, we call that a no contest clause, and I put them in all the stuff that we do. Uh, so it, it tries to reduce family fights, but it really doesn't affect the, the cost or the, the timing of the process really at all. So I, I say you want it in there, but it doesn't have a whole lot of effect until somebody decides to fight and it keeps people from fighting. Does it work? Does that work? Yes. Oh. I've, heard that, I've heard that they're that really, that's kind oh. of in there, but. I, I, I've had them work numerous times. Nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, sometimes they don't work because you'll have somebody come in and fight that's not listed as a beneficiary anyway, and they don't got anything to lose. So it's not a sure, you know, ironclad, but it does dramatically help some situations. Okay. Next question. Would a trust be needed if you are the guardian of the estate? Um, it depends. Uh, and I need more information. And so that person, I would highly recommend, let's set up a time for me to talk to you. I'll do a phone call and I'll be more than happy to talk more about the details of that. Um, a guardian of the estate can help prevent uh, setting anything up, uh, depending on how the money is held. But I do a lot of uh, trust for people that are guardian of the state because it makes their life easier. Are only lawyers able to help a person create a medical power of attorney? Uh, no, uh, but I do not recommend you have a medical power of attorney done by not somebody that's not a lawyer. Is debt inheritable, such as credit card debt? No. So that's another misconception that a lot of people have. Texas is a community property state, but it is not a community debt state. So uh, a lot of my clients, I, I'll tell them, don't have credit cards together. Because if she has credit cards and you have credit cards and you pass away, she's not responsible for your credit cards. Only your estate is. 
And, and so a, a, a lot of times a trust, again, helps that because in order for creditors to collect, they have to go to court. And a trust doesn't go to court unless they bring it into court, which they usually won't. So, so no, you do not inherit. The, the spouse doesn't inherit debt. The children don't inherit debt from other people. Okay. How much does it cost to create and maintain a trust? I'm going to give you the wonderful, dreaded attorney answer. It depends. Because it really depends on the person. Um, I don't have a you know, one-size-fits-all, so it all is tailored. But I can give you a ballpark. Uh, typically, they, a good trust. And again, this is one of those areas that you get what you pay for. And, 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 and I, you know, I'm not saying that because this is what I do for a living, but don't go cheap. Because if you go cheap, you get what you pay for and you're going to regret it. So a good trust typically start around twenty-five to 3500 and go up from there. Um, most of my family trusts are right around the five, $6,000 range, uh, depending on what they need done. Um, but again, you're spending five, $6,000 to avoid $9,000 in probate fees. So when you're just looking at finances, it makes sense. I had a gentleman have me set up a trust for him. This is before I even thought of it this way. I had a gentleman set up a trust for him when all he had was a house. And he, he realized that by setting up a trust for he and his wife, he avoided two probates and the house could pass down to his kids outside of probate. And so he paid me $2,500 extra to do a, a trust and he saved $9,000 in probate fees. How brilliant is that? So, so you, you got to lay the, and that's why usually when I meet with people, the first meeting is educating and talking about this is what you have. This is what you're looking at. This is all your options. And now you decide what's best for you. Is there or are there any disadvantages to setting up a trust? The initial cost, having to pay for it to set it up, and the a little bit of inconvenience of making sure you fund it. Uh, so I, 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 I wouldn't even call those disadvantages. They're inconveniences. You know, it's always inconvenience to have to pay for something. It's always inconvenience to have to go to the bank and talk to your financial advisor. But no, in, in, as far as a, a disadvantage of it not being a good idea, I, I'm, I'm, I think trusts are the best thing that were ever invented. And that's because they were invented so that people with money could avoid the government and the courts. And, and so I always tell people, the government is always gonna pass laws to hurt the middle class, but they're gonna pass laws to make sure they don't get hurt. Trusts are used for that purpose. So, so there's nothing but advantages to trust. Is there a percentage of tax that you pay when you set up a trust? No, the, there, there is not tax issues. And again, that's a little hard to answer. There are tax issues we have to deal with, but no, as far as setting the trust up and it being a taxable event, no, it's not a taxable event. Okay. If a beneficiary disputes the trust, can legal fees be paid by the trust? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Um, that was the this, greatest one. I just want to answer. Yeah, I, I okay. Like this next one is lengthy. Okay. Are there... Okay, hold on. Let me get back. I lost the thing. Okay. Would guardianship of a special needs individual transfer over to the next living relative, sibling, if both parents are deceased? This would include the special needs trust as well. Okay. There, a, a trust and a guardianship, two different things. Um, so you can have a, a trust set up and yes, the trust will automatically go from one trustee to another trustee. Um, and, and there's some paperwork that needs to be done usually in the law in the lawyer's office, but that's a pretty smooth transition. Guardianship's a different thing. When you're a guardian, you're appointed by the court. So if you're going to transfer to somebody else, that person has to get appointed by the court. So you have to do a legal proceeding to transfer guardianship from one person to another, and that costs money, but it's not real hard to do if everybody's in agreement. How much does a medical power of attorney cost? 
It, it, again, it depends, but uh, typically you can get them done, you know, single documents are about 250 bucks. Okay. Do, uh, I don't understand that question, so I can't read that one. If you know you are in a will, but the executor won't probate or share the information, how can you find out what you've inherited? Uh, you would have to initiate the, the probate proceeding. So you would have to hire an attorney and initiate the probate proceeding, force the executor to produce the will, and then go through the process. Okay. And the next one I can answer. Are there printable resources available anywhere to give to potential clients, low income, that explain wills, trust, and financial planning along with their importances? Yes. And I will be happy Stacy, to send that to you. Um, but we have a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things, and I know Brian has some things that he can share as well. But we would be more than happy to do this. If you guys will send those to me, I'm going to send the recording out link out okay. to everyone um, when we're done because I've had several people ask about the recording, and I've had emails of people that weren't, you know, at the last minute couldn't make it. But I'll just include those links um, if you have them, um, or or if they're documents, I can create links for them. Okay, I did the one question I can't. Um, it's, one of them, do you uh, understand that question, Marty? <laughs> yeah. Do you do you have a list of forms to be filled out before seeing them? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, personally, and again, every attorney does it differently. Uh, I use the first meeting to gather what I call thirty thousand foot information. So I don't want to overburden my potential clients at the beginning. We it's more of a discussion. So I don't, I don't usually ask for a whole lot of information ahead of time. Some attorneys will send out a questionnaire and say, hey, I want you names, address, kids, assets, all that kind of stuff. So it all depends on what attorney you're dealing with. Um, but I, 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 I've just found that I would rather talk to, to them first, find out a little bit about the family, find out priorities and what you want to do, talk about all the options, and then I gather that information from them once they've decided what they want to do. There's some questions in the chat. I, I don't know if you see those. She, she yeah, that's out. what I just pulled them up too. There's some that we didn't get. Yes. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a medical social worker in the first place, Aaron. God bless you for what you do. Yeah. But why shouldn't I help a patient complete a medical power of attorney? Um, probably because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and I don't mean that offensive I, I, by any means, but uh, it's like me trying to do your job. I, I don't know what you do. And so me trying to help that client uh, do something I don't know is not always a good idea. And you may, you may not fill in blanks right. It may not be signed right. It, you know, there's a lot of technicalities that need to be done. Now, I have no problem with, with uh, I've had social workers get with me, we'll do the documents, and then they'll help them execute them, and we'll work with them to help them execute them. That's, that's a great idea. Uh, you just don't know, I mean, if you print something off the internet, you don't know if it's good or not. You, there, you, it's buyer beware over the internet. And so depending on where you get the document from and, and, and how you walk them through it, and that's where the problems happen that I, I just I get concerned about. Okay, this is for both of you. Can a portion of a special needs trust be invested, such as a Roth IRA, traditional IRA, other mutual funds, et cetera? I'll let you have this one, Brian. Yeah, you can invest in, in a special needs trust, absolutely. You can take whatever the assets are and buy whatever you want, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whatever. Roth IRA, that's a completely separate entity. That's, that's not, that would not be within a special needs trust. That would be separate. Um, there's rules around Roth IRAs. You have to have earned income and things like that. So uh, potentially if the special needs individual was employed and had income, they could have a separate Roth IRA potentially in an example like that and also have uh, money invested in there. The, the big thing though oftentimes is with a special needs trust, you're trying to shelter that money and maintain benefits. Um, so if you had a lot of your own money, especially this kind of gets into some of the Medicaid planning and things like that. Um, some of it could be money that would be 
uh, taken back from, from Medicaid. They may, you know, see that asset and, and take it in the future or make you give them part of that, uh, anything that's outside that special needs trust. Okay, uh, any, easy answer is yes. Any trust that can be invested. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't change what you would do with or without the trust as far as managing the money, investing the money, doing the right thing with it. It, it can do in and out of the trust. You know, I'm going to reach out. There's a question on here about uh, pro bono work um, in, in regards to medical power of attorney for people that are low income. And, and I'll let you answer that in just a minute, Fred, um, if you guys do any of that. But um, I will say that I know there's some people on from Legal Aid of Northwest Texas. Um, I've, I've seen a couple of email addresses come through. Um, if you guys are on, can you guys just put in the chat whether you guys um, – provide those services uh, to help low-income people do medical power of attorneys. Um, if you could just put that in the chat, I appreciate it. And then Fred, I'll let you answer. Oh, that, that'd be awesome, yeah. Um, every attorney does pro bono work. Um, we, we, we're, we don't shy away from that. And if you need something, I just said, yes, Legal Aid does. So that's great. So any of these low-incomes, reach out to Legal Aid. If they can't help you or they're, not, they're busy or whatever, Give me a call. I'll I'll get you a power of attorney so the you know at least it's something I know it'll be good. That that uh, I'll be more than happy to help people uh, in that situation. Just just reach out to me. Okay, addressing your example of a trust for a home. What is the advantage of a trust over a transfer on death deed? Okay, <laughs> um, I don't like transfer on death deed. And, and most of your uh, uh, estate planning attorneys are shying away from them because we don't know how they're going to be viewed in the future. Now, the law was passed, I want to say, three, four years ago, I guess it's been now, allowing people to do a transfer on death deed. Um, but we don't know what the title companies are going to view that when it comes down the road. For instance, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, a quite, uh, what people have heard of a quit claim deed. And years ago, the people would do these quit claim deeds, uh, basically saying, I'm giving away my interest in the property. Title companies will not acknowledge a quit claim deed anymore. So it's basically useless. So, so doing a transfer on death deed to me is way too risky because we don't know 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now how the title companies will view it. And there's a big difference between what the law allows and what the rules are. And the rules with the title companies are a lot different than what the law allows because they're insurance companies and they're underwriters and they're guaranteed title. And if there's anything that they're not sure about, they're not going to do it. And so I don't recommend transfer on death deed. Okay. Again, on a special needs trust, does the beneficiary need a, this is a good one, a diagnosis? What if it's a personality disorder which the adult beneficiary has used to excuse getting fired, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. Um, setting up a special needs trust is really for somebody that, that gets government benefit. Because I've even had people say, well, I've got an autistic child, I've got somebody with cerebral palsy, but but we've got money and they're not getting Medicaid or Social Security or anything like that. The whole purpose of a special needs trust is so whoever it is, whatever they, their problem is, mental, 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 physical, anything, if they can qualify for government benefits, this money doesn't disqualify them. So it really, when I set up special needs trusts, I don't really dive into the special need, what it is, what it's all about. It's okay, we're setting this up because it's a special legal mechanism so that if the person who's the beneficiary needs government benefits, they can get it. I hope that answers your question. Okay, is it difficult to change the title to a trust if you have a mortgage? Oh, no. And, and I think the question, it's not changing the title of the, mor uh, the trust. It's, it's retitling the the, the uh uh, house into the name of the trust. So a lot of people get that confused and that, that's a very common question I have. Um, there, there's two different things. There's the title and there's the mortgage and, and they're not the same. And the mortgage company, all they care about is getting paid. 
And, and all they care about is that they can go after the house if you don't pay them. And so we retitled the, the, the house into the name of the trust. That doesn't affect the mortgage at all. It doesn't affect homestead exemptions. It doesn't affect over senior, you know, senior 65 exemptions. It doesn't affect disability exemptions. Just if you put it into a living trust, you get everything you would if it was in your name. You just now avoided probate. Okay, as the trustee of a special needs trust for my sister, how do I find out what allowable expenses are with are are okay with trust funds? Okay, the trust has should have direction, and the trust code of Texas has direction. So there, there the the statutory law says certain things are allowed, not allowed, and the trust mechanism, the document itself, should say some things. Um, if you need some guidance on that, we'll be more than happy to, to meet with you and talk to you about that. Um, okay. Just so you know, uh, Becky Mosley has put the uh, phone number for Legal Aid of uh, Northwest Texas um, in the chat for anybody that's interested. And, and if you get a piece of paper and a pencil, I'll read it off just real quick for you. It's 866-395-2047. Once again, 866 866- 395-2047. I'm sorry, Sheila, go ahead. No, 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 I was just, um, okay. I don't, um, if a party has a custody order that awarded her the primary custodian, if she dies, the other parent would get custody. Is there anything other than doing a declaration of guardianship and a will that could help the dying party make sure the other parent doesn't get to become the primary custodian? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a more complicated question than it sounds. Yeah. Uh, because it involves both custody. Okay, so in, in Texas, we have guardianship and we have conservatorship. Conservatorship is a family law matter that's dealt with in family court. Guardianship is a probate matter dealt with in probate court. So a parental issue like that is both a, uh, that's a complicated legal issue. That, but, but I guess to make it short, can you put documents in place? Yes, you can put other documents in place to show your wishes. But at the same time, a biological parent has certain rights that, that automatically they get. Um, so uh, that's one you want to talk to somebody about. You need legal advice. This is this is a seminar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just get yeah, that no, one. Really, those, those are serious issues. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's a definite legal advice question. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, there was a question um, on here. As a trustee of a special needs trust for my sister, how do I find out what allowable expenses are with, I guess, within the trust fund or? The trust fund can pay. Okay, yeah, we, we addressed that one just a minute ago, and it, 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 it that's okay. It's whatever the document says, and then there's the trust code of Texas, which is a statutory laws that, that dictate that. So she would uh, it'd be advisable to talk to an attorney about that. And I apologize. I, I just I saw I thought it was new coming in. Thank you. That's okay. Um, I don't. I'm gonna have to read this because Fred, I don't. Wouldn't the spouse be the legal? N O K, whatever that is. And, and be, oh. Answered that one, Sheila, earlier, but I, again, there is not an automatic spouse right. So that's just the easiest way to under, okay. uh, understand it is the spouse doesn't have automatic legal authority to make decisions for their spouse. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, While she's looking at the next one, uh, up on the screen is my information and Brian's information. Please write that down, and you'll have it when you, it's sent to you. But if we can be a resource to anybody out there, just call us. I'll be more than happy to answer questions or, or guide you any way we can help you. Uh, Marty, yeah. do you see any I've missed? What, one just came, a big one just okay. came up on the okay. on the chat. I'll let you tell. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Okay. How do you go about getting someone to oversee benefits for... MI and IDD consumers. Oh, men, uh, yes. Uh, okay. And IDD consumers that have no family. 
they are the ones that are not P-A-S-S-R. Marty, you should have done this one because I don't know <laughs> what all these mean. That's it. Go ahead. You go ahead because I, I really don't know all of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. That's our, I, I believe that's one of the, one of the, um, one of the um, benefits um, programs but, um, that get to H HCS services. So, so basically they haven't gotten, I guess, the H into the PASAR program. Many of my consumers who are transitioning back to the community end up going to a group home. Someone, I'm sorry, some who are higher functioning go to assisted living where they are required to make their own payments and manage their own accounts. I have some that have survivor benefits. That, that's a very difficult area for all of us um, is, is working with people who don't have family or, or they, they don't have somebody that can help. Um, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of disheartened with what the DFW area has available for those people because there's really not much. Uh, when I was practicing law out in El Paso, El Paso had a thing called Project LULAC which was an organization that would step in and be guardian of people that needed a guardian when they didn't have anybody else. Uh, they would manage uh, accounts. They would help them with that. There was, it was an organization that actually was paid by the county uh, to, to take care of some of these indigent type uh, people. And I have not found organizations out here like that. And, and it's a very frustrating, difficult area uh, to, to do. I've, I've appointed private fiduciaries, but again, they want to get paid. Um, and sometimes if there's funds, but, but no family, we can take care of that. But when there's no funds and no family, it, it's really, really difficult. And it, and it, yes. It we is. do have one person, Marty, and you probably know him too. I think his name is Chris Christian or something like it's Chris so I know and we have but he is so swamped with yeah. so many I I don't I I could have misheard this but I, I something I heard the other day said that he's right now not taking any new ones because he has to you know there's just not enough people yeah. like that that are doing this yeah I thought the senior source used to do that for seniors used to have a program and I don't know if they still do and oh. then there was another program out of Denton that did a little bit of that. Um, and I don't know if they do either, but, but I can check on that. If somebody has a question, you can email me okay. and, and, and get back. Um, um, and then the next one, Fred, this is interesting. I work for Legal Aid and we get a lot of clients with disabled children. They are low income. Do they still need a special needs trust? If so, what do you recommend for them to do? Because that is usually out of our expertise. Uh, um, it, it, that money depends. Uh, we, we really want to look at what, if any, assets are going to be left for this child. Um, because it's really money that, that triggers the special need, need for special needs trusts. They're going to inherit something that will jeopardize their benefits. So those are typically on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but if there's any chance of the child inheriting something of value, we want to look at it. And, and so there are some attorneys in town that will do uh, reduced fee cases or pro bono to try to help set stuff like that up. She said usually it is just a home that would be left to them. Yeah, the home is tricky um, depending on what it is, but the home in and of itself usually doesn't disqualify somebody. Okay. And then here is Courtney says, I am currently the administrator for the guardianship program. Guardianship is county by county program, especially for indigent individuals. So Marty, there is someone on here that does that. Oh, That's wonderful. a wonderful resource, Courtney, because she's in Denton County. But I mean, that's a great resource. Well, make sure you get her information. She looks yes. you definitely Courtney, want send me, Courtney, send me your information. I'll, I'll pass it on um, to everybody, actually. But, but send that to me, will you? Yeah, definitely. 